This presentation is a review of select anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs. Be sure to review these drugs in your pharmacology text and other reliable resources, such as a drug reference book. Let's begin by differentiating between anticoagulant and antiplatelet drugs. Remember, anticoagulants have the word coagulant in there, so we're referring to the coagulation cascade. And what's the whole point of this coagulation cascade? It produces fibrin. And remember, fibrin is what forms that mesh involved in the formation of a blood clot, so often at the site of an injury. So anticoagulants prevent formation of fibrin, which in turn prevents formation of those venous blood clots. Therefore, different anticoagulants will target different parts of that cascade, different factors in this chain reaction. And you can see all the different factors here in this image. So that's going to reduce the amount of fibrin that is produced. Some anticoagulants will actually prevent synthesis of the factors, and others will simply bind to the factors already existing in the bloodstream and inhibit them. Now, antiplatelets are referring to decreasing platelet aggregation, or that stickiness. Remember, when platelets aggregate, they form a clot, and a platelet core is what makes up the bulk of arterial thrombi. So antiplatelet drugs are primarily used to prevent thrombi in the arteries. So can you think of some examples of anticoagulants? What medications interact with this clotting cascade? Pause the presentation and see if you can come up with a few examples. So one very common example is heparin. Two major categories of heparin are high molecular weight heparin and low molecular weight heparin. And basically one is a larger molecule and one is a smaller molecule. So high molecular weight heparin is referred to just as heparin, whereas there are a couple of different types of low molecular weight heparin, but a common one that you'll see and that what we'll be discussing here in this presentation is Lovenox. So what does heparin do? How does it work? Well, remember we talked about how anticoagulants are anticoagulants because they're going to interfere with this clotting cascade. Well, heparins basically deactivate existing clotting factors that are already floating around in the blood. And they do this by binding to what's called antithrombin. And antithrombin is a naturally occurring molecule in our body that is already de deactivating certain factors. But when we give somebody heparin, it kind of revs up antithrombin, and it helps it do its job faster and better. So when antithrombin is activated by heparin, it usually ends up deactivating quite a few factors. So you can see all of those here in yellow. But ultimately, this is going to reduce the total amount of fibrin produced. So next we have warfarin. And warfarin, rather than helping antithrombin deactivate these yellow factors here, Warfarin prevents future synthesis of factors. So it's not going to affect the factors that are already floating around. It's going to prevent new factors from being made. And certain factors need vitamin K in order to be synthesized. So warfarin is going to target those factors, and you can see those here in green. Now our last example of anticoagulants is dabigatran, or Pradaxa. And Pradaxa does not inhibit synthesis of factors, it actually inhibits the factor itself. So Pradaxa focuses on thrombin, and you can see thrombin here, it's the factor right before fibrinogen turns into fibrin. Now let's see if you can come up with the examples of antiplatelet drugs. Pause the presentation and try to think of some examples. So here we have aspirin and clopidogrel, or Plavix. Remember, these drugs are inhibiting the platelet's ability to stick together in a sense. So aspirin achieves this by inhibiting COX-1, and keep in mind it also is going to be inhibiting COX-2 at the same time, but it gets its antiplatelet action from COX-1 inhibition. And Plavix does this by blocking specific sticky receptors on the platelet called ADP receptors. So before we jump into specific antiplatelet drugs or specific anticoagulants, keep in mind that regardless of which drug we're giving, this patient is going to be more prone to bleeding once they're given the drug. Warfarin, Plavix, aspirin, heparin, whatever it is, they all have something in common. 
we are now watching for signs of bleeding as the nurse. So these are symptoms we need to watch for in any patient receiving any anticoagulant or any antiplatelet. So what are signs of bleeding? What about GI bleed, so that black tarry stool, or retroperitoneal bleed, or hematuria, or petechiae, changes in hemoglobin and hematocrit. So you can see here over a few days, somebody's H&H &H dropped. What will their vital signs look like? Well, if someone is hypovolemic due to a hemorrhage, their blood pressure will drop. But remember, their heart rate will likely increase as well, that reflex tachycardia in response to hypovolemia. So it's also important to consider, is this patient at an increased risk for bleeding already before we even give them this anticoagulant? Do they already have a risk for a GI bleed? And now we're going to give them heparin or aspirin. So for example, do they already have peptic ulcer disease? Or are they already on prednisone or ibuprofen, both of which increase risk for a GI bleed? Also, any time a patient is on more than one anticoagulant or antiplatelet, the risk for bleeding increases. So remember, regardless of the drug, these anticoagulants and antiplatelets are going to increase our risk for bleeding. We need to be watching for all of these signs and also considering the risks that they already have for bleeding. So beginning with anticoagulants, let's review heparin. Remember, anticoagulants are for venous thrombi. So a patient who has just undergone surgery and is at risk for a DVT, or a patient with a current DVT, a pulmonary embolism, somebody who has suffered a thrombotic stroke, not a hemorrhagic stroke, or maybe they suffered an acute myocardial infarction. It's also a treatment for DIC, which involves that overconsumption of clotting factors due to excessive production of microclots. So slowing this process down, this coagulation process down with heparin can be a treatment for DIC. Now one benefit of heparin is that it does not cross into the placenta or breast milk. So this is appropriate to use in pregnancy. And one key point to remember is that heparin is a powerful drug, but it can't dissolve existing clots. So we don't give heparin to a patient with a DVT because we want to dissolve the DVT with heparin. We give it to that patient so that the DVT doesn't get bigger. So heparin can only be given IV or sub-Q. We don't give it IM because this could cause hematomas and we don't give it orally because it won't work orally. So since we're giving heparin to reduce production of fibrin and efficacy of that clotting cascade, we need to monitor how well it is doing this. And therefore we monitor the partial thromboplastin time or PTT. And sometimes an activator is added to this test to speed it up and thus you may see APTT used instead. Now because we want to slow down the clotting time with this heparin, we're looking for a longer PTT. So rather than normal lab values, we want the PTT to be one and a half to two times longer than a normal PTT, than somebody not taking heparin. Now when we consider what the nurse should be looking for once a patient has received heparin, we go back to what we just discussed about bleeding, watching for all of those signs of bleeding and the risk factors for bleeding. But we also, specifically to heparin, need to look for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. And HIT is fairly rare, but if we do see a notable decrease in platelets after a patient has gotten heparin, heparin should be discontinued. Now with heparin, you may also see osteoporosis develop, but this is in patients who have been taking heparin long term. So now let's say you're taking care of a patient on heparin who begins to hemorrhage. Their blood pressure is dropping, their heart rate is increasing, and we realize the heparin is working a little too well. Heparin can be reversed by protamine sulfate, and this actually binds to and deactivates heparin. So who should not get heparin? Well, patients who already have a severe risk of bleeding or complications from bleeding shouldn't get heparin. Uh, patients who already have low platelets or uncontrollable bleeding or have undergone eye or brain or spinal surgery, and also patients who have had or will have a lumbar puncture, these patients should not get heparin. And we should still be very careful and avoid using heparin in patients who have a risk for bleeding, bleeding or a risk for hemorrhagic stroke. So severe hypertension or an aneurysm. 
And also because heparin is metabolized in the liver and excreted by the kidneys, we should be very cautious in patients who have liver or kidney disease. So your job as the nurse is always to monitor for these signs of bleeding and continue to monitor the PTT according to the hospital protocol. When giving heparin subcutaneously, remember your guidelines for giving subcutaneous injections. So anytime heparin is administered, it should also be verified with another RN because this is a high risk drug and that should be documented in the chart. Now, one unique thing about heparin as opposed to other drugs that we'll discuss in this presentation is continuous IV heparin drips. Why would someone need a continuous infusion of heparin of an anticoagulant? So DVTs and pulmonary emboli are some of the most common reasons for this. Remember venous clots. Now, giving heparin IV is very different than giving heparin subcutaneously. If you recall, heparin is a very variable drug. Our free drug levels will vary from patient to patient, and it can be really difficult to predict. This is why heparin is not allowed to be used at home. So heparin is a drug that is titrated when given IV. Therefore, anytime we titrate a drug, remember fentanyl, pancuronium, midazolam, all of these IV drips that are titrated by the nurse, we must follow a protocol. Otherwise, we're prescribing and practicing outside our scope of practice. So here you can see one of those protocols. And this protocol is actually attached in your weekly module if you'd like to review it up close during this part of the presentation. So these protocols will vary by hospital, but most will look somewhat similar and follow similar principles. So let's take a look at this specific protocol and see what we would do to start this heparin drip. So if you take a moment to glance at this protocol, you'll see a lot of kgs or kilograms. This protocol is based off of our patient's weight, so you can see how important it is to get an accurate weight on your patient before moving forward. Imagine the ripple effects of using an inaccurate weight from the beginning and carrying that through every calculation. So once we have an accurate weight, you can see that the first thing we need to do is assess our patient's baseline labs. Why are we gonna do this? Well, back to what we said about anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs overall, we're worried about bleeding. So we need to see if our patient is already at risk for bleeding, if they're anemic or have low platelets, or maybe their PTT is already high. And you'll note that the protocol says to discontinue all other heparins. We want to control as much as we can with this protocol. So any subcutaneous Lovenox or sub-Q heparin should be stopped when we start this heparin drip protocol. Now, since we don't want to just slowly start this little drip of heparin, we need to kind of jumpstart or load up our patients with heparin before we settle down into a maintenance drip rate. And this is why we start with an initial bolus. So you can see here, there's a calculation for how much of a bolus we give our patients on based on our patient's weight again. So note that because we are using a high-risk drug, an anticoagulant, this should be programmed into the IV pump using what are called guardrails. And basically these guardrails tell the pump that we're giving a risky drug. The pump has preset warnings built in so that if we accidentally give way too high of a dose of heparin, for instance, it will warn us and basically say, that seems like a very high dose for heparin. Are you sure you wanna do that? So it kind of alerts us regarding the drug that we have programmed into the pump. So we program the pump to administer this quick bolus of heparin to get our patient started. And then next, you'll see we are to start at our infusion rate. So see the difference here? Our bolus was 80 units per kilogram, and the maintenance rate is 18 units per kilogram. That's our maintenance drip rate. That sounds more like maintenance, right? 18 units per kilogram. So when you do these calculations, you should note that your infusion rate should be much lower than your bolus rate. And this can be helpful to check your math and make sure you're on the right track. So moving down this protocol, we've delivered our bolus and now we've got our infusion running. Next, it tells us that we need to check an APTT every six hours. So remember that an APTT should be a little longer, one and a half to two times longer than a normal APTT since our patient is getting heparin and they have maybe a venous thrombus that we don't want to clot as quickly. So we go into our patient's room and we draw the blood and we put it in the tube and we send it down to the lab. And we'll be checking the EHR and trying to see if our results are up. Sometimes we'll even call down to the lab to see if they have our results. 
but we wait a little bit to see what our patient's APTT is. Once we get the results, we need to take a look back at our protocol. What do we do according to the results that we've got? So you can see here, we need to see where our APTT falls. Is it below 30, between 30 and 51, between 52 and 67? Notice that area is shaded and that's exactly where we want our APTT to be. That's the sweet spot. Is it too high, like 68 to 95, or is it even above 95? So notice that if our APTT is too low, we end up giving more heparin, giving another little bolus or increasing our rate. And that makes sense, right? So we want our heparin to increase our APTT. So if it's too low, we need more heparin. If our APTT is too high, our heparin is working a little too well. So we end up turning down our rate or even pausing the infusion for an hour. So we continue this process of checking APTT, making changes to the rate as necessary, and then checking APTT in six more hours. But notice if we hit that sweet spot twice in a row, that shaded area of 52 to 67, then it's not necessary to monitor our patient as closely. So we can move to checking the APTT only once every 24 hours. But that's only if we hit that shaded area of 52 to 67 twice in a row, so every six hours for two times. So let's test your knowledge. Get a calculator, your heparin drip protocol that you have in the module, or you can use the one on the screen here, and some paper. And let's work through a heparin drip order from the beginning. So here we have Mario. And Mario was just diagnosed with a saddle pulmonary embolism. And this basically means a pulmonary embolism that is straddling the main pulmonary arterial trunk. So you see Mario weighs 176 pounds. Now remember, you first need to check the patient's baseline labs. You make sure that he has good IV access. You grab tubing, you get the bag of heparin, and you can see the bag label here to the right. You verify your orders and that you have the correct medication with another nurse. And you make sure that the concentration in the heparin bag is correct and consistent with the orders in the EHR as well. So you pull up the protocol and you need to begin with an initial bolus. Pause the presentation and calculate how much the initial bolus should be. You'll first get a number in units and then, using the heparin bag label on the right, calculate how many milliliters that bolus will be. Pause the presentation and calculate your answer. So the first thing to remember is that these calculations are for kilograms. So we need to start by converting pounds to kilograms. There are 2.2 pounds in every one kilogram. So remember, someone will always have a higher number in pounds than in kilograms. So 176 divided by 2.2 is 80. So this patient weighs 80 kilograms, and we will use this for the rest of our calculations. Then you can see here that the bolus is 80 units per kilogram, so 80 units for each of those 80 kilos, which would be 80 times 80, or 6,400 units. So this patient, Mario, will be getting a loading bolus dose of 6,400 units. And notice our max bolus dose is 8,000 units. So this kind of helps me recognize that the math is probably in the right ballpark. I didn't get 64,000 units or 640 units. I'm closer to the max, but I'm not over the max. So we've got this 6,400 units, but next you need to verify that this bolus dose is correct with another nurse. Have them check your math. And now you need to actually administer that bolus. Well, our heparin is available to us in a mixed bag of 5% dextrose. So we aren't just giving straight units of heparin. We need to see what the concentration is. So here we see that every milliliter of fluid in this bag will have 100 units of heparin. So that tells me that there is a lot more heparin than milliliters in this bag. We have 100 units in every milliliter. So it's pretty concentrated. So I'm gonna anticipate having to give less fluid than the number of units, so less than 6,400 6, milliliters. That would be one unit per milliliter. So to figure out how many milliliters to give Mario, I take 6,400 units and divide that by 100. So basically I'm asking how many 100 units are there in 6,400 units? So the answer is 64. So this patient will get 64 milliliters of this solution from this bag.
Now, note that some hospital protocols indicate that you actually administer this heparin bolus via IV push, because if you think about it, 64 milliliters is still a pretty significant amount of fluid. So they would use a higher concentration of heparin to deliver that quick bolus, but that's gonna depend on the hospital and on the protocol. So now our bolus has been administered, what's next? So looking at number five on this heparin protocol, we need to calculate the infusion rate. Pause the presentation and calculate the starting infusion rate for this heparin drip. How many units and then how many milliliters per hour will the pump deliver? So we still have our 80 kilogram patient, but he's going to be getting 18 units per kilogram each hour. So we take 80 kilograms and multiply this by 18 units, which is 1,440 units. Notice this is below the max dose of 1,800 units per hour, which again helps us verify that our math is on the right track. So 1,440 is the number of units Mario will get each hour, but how many milliliters of this IV blag of fluid will he get? So with 100 units in one milliliter, we take that 1,440 units and divide it by 100, which is 14.4 milliliters per hour. So now before actually typing that into our pump, you would verify this rate change and check your math with another nurse. So what's next? Well, per the protocol, we need to draw an APTT every six hours. So you would send this down to the lab and wait for your result. You see that Mario's APTT is 28. So what do you do next? Take a look at the protocol and pause the presentation as you calculate what adjustments might need to be made in milliliters and milliliters per hour. You can see here that his APTT falls into this category. It's below 30. So think about this. He didn't get enough heparin. It's not in that shaded spot of 52 to 67 yet. So we can anticipate that he's gonna be needing more heparin. And in this particular protocol, it's asking us to re-bolus him with 60 units per kilogram and then follow that by restarting his continuous drip rate at a faster rate, so two more units per hour than we were running it before. So let's calculate the bolus first. We have an 80 kilogram patient and our bolus is supposed to be 60 units per kilogram. So 80 multiplied by 60 is 4,800 units. Therefore, if we use this bag of heparin to deliver that bolus, we divide that 4,800 units by 100 units per milliliter and get a 48 milliliter bolus. So now that we've checked our math with another nurse and administered the bolus, we need to see what our maintenance rate will be. So our protocol says to increase the rate by two units per kilogram per hour. So since our starting rate was 18 units per kilogram per hour, we now increase that 18 to 20 units per kilo per hour, a two unit per kilo per hour increase. So we multiply 20 units by 80 kilograms and we get 1600 units per hour. And again, we divide this number by 100 to take into consideration the concentration of heparin in the bag and we get 1600 divided by 100 which is 16 milliliters an hour. So now we're set for six hours. We are gonna be running at 16 milliliters an hour, but six hours after we make this change, we need to go into Mario's room and draw a P APTT. So you can see how these patients not only require a lot of monitoring for signs of bleeding and complications from heparin, but we are drawing these labs, waiting to get these lab results and calculating very important adjustments to their heparin drip rate throughout the shift. So moving from high molecular weight heparin to low molecular weight heparin, let's look at Lovenox. So Lovenox acts very similarly to heparin in that it's going to bind to antithrombin to deactivate factors in the coagulation cascade. But there are a couple of important differences to recognize when we look at Lovenox versus heparin. So Lovenox is going to have a longer half-life than heparin, so it's going to be given only once or twice a day subcutaneously. Also, one of the major benefits of Lovenox is that we don't have to be monitoring their PTT. Lovenox is not nearly as variable and unpredictable as heparin, and it's dosed by body weight, so typically one milligram per kilogram. Now, what do you need to think about as the nurse when caring for a patient on Lovenox? Well, fortunately, because Lovenox is similar enough to high molecular weight heparin, you can still use the antidote, protamine sulfate, 
to treat a hemorrhage caused by Lovenox. However, be aware that there are still other types of low molecular weight heparin, such as one of the newer versions, Fondaparinux or Erixtra, where protamine sulfate actually cannot be used as a reversal agent. It won't work. So also, while there's a small risk for thrombocytopenia with Lovenox, the risk is actually much lower with this low molecular weight heparin. So looking at another anticoagulant, warfarin or coumadin, we're now talking about preventing synthesis of factors, not deactivating currently existing factors. So you could look at this as maybe a messy kitchen floor covered in cookie crumbs. So heparin cleans up the cookie crumbs on the floor with a broom, but warfarin is actually just going to keep you from making cookies in the first place. So the only problem with keeping you from making cookies in the first place is what if you had a cookie jar full of cookies? And I won't let you make any more cookies, but you could still sit in the kitchen and eat a bunch of them and make a bunch of cookie crumbs. So, oh, so I have to wait for all of these cookies to be eaten up before I start to see a cleaner floor and the effects of me not letting you make cookies anymore. So with this loose analogy, we can see why warfarin works much more slowly than heparin. We're only targeting the development of factors, not the existing factors. So it can actually take several days to see an effect or see that clean kitchen floor. Also, it will have a lasting effect after we've stopped warfarin. So once we stop it, it will still take a few days, about two to five days, for the patient to get back to how they were before we started warfarin. Now, warfarin is used most commonly for long-term use. It's geared toward patients at risk for a thrombosis. So, for example, those at risk for a PE, those with mechanical heart valves, patients with atrial fibrillation, that's very common. And as you may recall from pharmacology, warfarin has many, many drug interactions. So here you can see some examples of drugs that increase levels of warfarin and others that decrease levels of warfarin. So for example, if I take metronidazole while taking warfarin, I may need to lower my warfarin dose so that I'm not at an elevated risk for bleeding because I'm going to have more warfarin in my system and I'm going to have increased effects of warfarin. Now if I'm taking cholestyramine, which is a bile acid sequestrant, I may need to actually increase my dose of warfarin since it may not be as effective when taking those two drugs together. So also, if a patient has been taking warfarin for 12 months or more, they're going to be at an increased risk for fractures. So one of the key concepts to remember about warfarin is that the INR must be monitored in a patient taking warfarin. A normal INR is typically around 0.8 to 1.2. However, we want to see a higher INR for patients taking warfarin. And INR is basically a calculation based off of time. So we want our patient to coagulate more slowly. We want a bigger number. So most often we're looking for an INR between 2 and 3, but there are certain cases where an INR of 3.5, or you can see here even upwards of 4.5 are indicated. So we talked about how warfarin works by inhibiting synthesis of clotting factors, and it targets the clotting factors that need vitamin K in order to be synthesized. So you may recall that dietary education for these patients is critical. Patients do not have to avoid or increase their vitamin K intake. The key is that they're consistent with their vitamin K intake. We don't want them to randomly go on a leafy green diet and then stop, or then go on a green tea kick for a week and then go back to black coffee. They need to make sure they're consistent with these types of foods that have vitamin K. So notice that if suddenly a patient consumes a lot of vitamin K, that is going to counteract the effects of warfarin. And you'll notice that vitamin K is actually the treatment for a warfarin overdose. Also, if they suddenly decrease their normal vitamin K intake, then this will actually increase the effects of warfarin. So it's important to not only know that patients need to know what foods have vitamin K, but as a nurse, you need to actually know what foods have vitamin K. So take a look at this list of examples here. Additionally, conditions that could disrupt hepatic synthesis of clotting factors are also considered contraindications for warfarin. So patients with liver disease, alcoholism, and vitamin K deficiency should not be taking warfarin. And then note here that warfarin is a pregnancy risk category X drug. So this basically means that the risks of harming the fetus with warfarin outweigh the potential benefits of warfarin.
Now let's look at another drug that inhibits an existing coagulation factor, the ones already floating out in the bloodstream. This is dabigatran, or Pradaxa. And this drug directly inhibits thrombin. So typically, Pradaxa is used to prevent stroke in patients at risk, for example, those with atrial fibrillation, but it's not indicated for patients with atrial fibrillation and have valvular disease. So what are the benefits and drawbacks of dabigatran when we compare it to warfarin? Well, dabigatran presents less risk of bleeding and actually has a quicker onset. Remember, warfarin can take several days to become effective, so patients actually have to be placed on something like Lovenox as a bridge to hold them over until their INR levels are therapeutic with just Coumadin or warfarin. And also, warfarin had a lot of drug and food interactions that Pradaxa does not. Additionally, patients do not need to go in and get their INR checked like patients on warfarin. And because warfarin doses may change for a patient over time, according to their fluctuating INR and maybe their amount of vitamin K intake, dabigatran may be considered more convenient because they used fixed dosing. So now what are the drawbacks of dabigatran? Well, patients often report more GI distress with this drug, and they also have to take it on a pretty strict schedule twice a day. Additionally, this is a newer drug. So with that comes limited experience, potentially a limited understanding of some of the possible issues with this drug, and also an antidote to dabigatran, Praxbind, was introduced in the market in 2015. So this actually improves the safety of this drug. Let's take a quiz. Which of the following is an advantage of Lovenox over heparin? Number one, heparin requires close monitoring of PTT, whereas Lovenox does not. Two, Lovenox can be given IV push and IM. Three, heparin requires monitoring of INR, whereas Lovenox does not. Or four, Lovenox can be given orally. Pause the presentation and consider your answer. The correct answer is one. Heparin requires close monitoring of PTT, whereas Lovenox does not. Remember, heparin is a more variable, less predictable drug, so we do not send patients home on heparin and we're monitoring their PTT in the hospital to see how well it's working in their system. Lovenox is much more stable and has fixed dosing, so typically that one milligram per kilogram of body weight. Let's look at another question. Which of the following is true about advantages of dabigatran or Pradaxa over warfarin? One, patients may have a higher INR with dabigatran. Two, patients do not have to be as careful with their diet with dabigatran. Three, the dosing schedule is less strict with dabigatran, or four, warfarin has no antidote and dabigatran does. Pause the presentation and consider your answer. The correct answer is two. So patients on dabigatran do not have to be as cognizant of what foods have vitamin K, like our patients who are taking warfarin. Remember, INR is not measured to assess efficacy of dabigatran, and it must be taken on a strict schedule twice a day. And then also, both of these drugs actually have antidotes. So dabigatran, uh, the antidote is Praxbind, and for warfarin, the antidote is vitamin K. So we will finish up with a discussion of antiplatelet drugs by discussing two exemplars, aspirin and clopidogrel, or Plavix. So as a reminder, we've just discussed anticoagulants, which interfere with the coagulation cascade and target venous thrombi. Now we're moving to antiplatelet drugs, which work very differently. We're targeting platelet aggregation, the core of an arterial clot, and these drugs work by interfering with or blocking receptors on platelets. So beginning with aspirin, it's important to recognize that aspirin has a lot of roles. It's commonly used as an antiplatelet drug, but has a number of other benefits to be aware of. As an antiplatelet drug, it's used for patients with risk of ischemic stroke, not hemorrhagic stroke, or transient ischemic attacks, it's also used for that, unstable or stable angina, patients with coronary stents. It's also used in an acute myocardial infarctions or even for patients with a history of an MI or risk of MI. So remember, aspirin or acetosalicylic acid is a COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitor. So thinking back to COX-1 and COX-2, or cyclooxygenase 1 and 2, 
by inhibiting both of these enzymes, it creates two groups of actions associated with COX-1 and a group associated with COX-2. So you can see here, by inhibiting COX-1, we get that antiplatelet activity, and that's why it's called an antiplatelet drug. However, this is also an analgesic drug and an antipyretic and an anti-inflammatory. So just as a quick reminder, you can see the therapeutic effects of aspirin in green associated with inhibiting COX-1 and then COX-2, but you can also see the negative effects in red associated with inhibiting COX-1 and then COX-2. So one key aspect to remember about aspirin is that the action will occur on the platelet for the life of the platelet. It's irreversible. So in a sense, that platelet will not aggregate until it dies, and its lifespan is about seven to 10 days. So therefore, aspirin must be stopped about a week before surgery. We can't reverse aspirin and uninhibit those platelets. We have to wait for those platelets to die in a sense. So as the nurse, what do we need to think about? Well, along with monitoring for all of those signs of bleeding that we've already talked about, you can base a lot of what you do as the nurse off of what happens when we inhibit COX-1 and COX-2. So aspirin should not be given in a patient with a hemorrhagic stroke because we're going to already reduce platelet aggregation and cause risk for bleeding. Also, because we're already monitoring our patients for signs of bleeding and we see that inhibiting COX-1 can cause GI distress, we need to be very conscientious of a potential GI bleed. This risk is actually quite high in patients taking aspirin. So patients with active peptic ulcer disease should not receive aspirin. This is a contraindication. And additionally, you may remember that patients with nasal polyps and allergic rhinitis are often at risk for aspirin sensitivity or even salicylate toxicity. So additionally, research has shown that smoking can actually inhibit the antiplatelet activity of aspirin. So another thing to remember is that aspirin is a pregnancy category D drug. So that means that there's evidence that aspirin could pose a risk to the fetus, but in some extreme cases it could be used if the benefits outweigh the risks. But generally aspirin is avoided in, in pregnancy if at all possible. So our next antiplatelet drug is clopidogrel or Plavix. And this is used for many of the antiplatelet reasons that aspirin is used. So to prevent stenosis of coronary stents, to prevent an MI or an ischemic stroke and other arteriovascular events. So clopidogrel blocks receptors on platelets and thus it's going to prevent platelet aggregation. A similarity between aspirin and clopidogrel is that both of these drugs inhibit platelet aggregation for the life of the platelet. This is also irreversible. As the nurse, we are again monitoring for all those signs of bleeding, and patients taking clopidogrel may rarely develop what's called thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, or TTP. And this most typically will happen in the first two weeks, if it happens at all, it's quite rare. But in the first two weeks of taking clopidogrel is when they see that it commonly happens for those patients that develop TTP. And the patient will present with hemolytic anemia, a low platelet count, kidney dysfunction, fevers, and even neurological disturbances. And TTT, TTP can be fatal, so it's really important to educate patients about this risk. And just a reminder, giving any antiplatelet drug with any other antiplatelet drug or anticoagulant will increase risk of bleeding. Now additionally, proton pump inhibitors, like omeprazole, can actually inhibit the antiplatelet effects of clopidogrel. So you can see how this might get a little tricky. We're concerned about GI bleed with any antiplatelet drug and any anticoagulant. So we try to protect the stomach by giving a proton pump inhibitor. But now we may have protected the stomach, but the clopidogrel is not effective anymore, not as effective anymore. However, if a patient is at risk for a GI bleed, maybe they have peptic ulcer disease. Certain professional organizations have determined that this small reduction in the efficacy of clopidogrel is actually worth it to reduce the risk of GI bleed with a proton pump inhibitor. So let's look at a question. Which of the following is not true about aspirin? One, aspirin will inhibit platelet aggregation for the life of the platelet. Two, aspirin should be stopped at least 24 hours prior to surgery. Three, Aspirin should be used with great caution in pregnant women. Or four, aspirin increases risk of GI bleed. Pause the presentation and consider your answer. The correct answer is two. 
as aspirin should actually be stopped at least a week prior to surgery. We are referring to that lifespan of the platelet here. Let's look at a final question here. Which of the following is true about clopidogrel versus dabigatran? Both dabigatran and clopidogrel have irreversible actions. Dabigatran is an antiplatelet drug. Clopidogrel is an anticoagulant. Neither drug requires assessment of INR to determine efficacy of the drug. Clopidogrel may cause GI distress. Dabigatran will not. Pause the presentation and consider your answer. The correct answer is three. Neither of these drugs requires assessment of INR to see if the drug is actually working appropriately.